pleasure to have uh, Adam Simon back here at Maryland. If you don't know, he was a student here. He finished in 1995, did a senior thesis with Phil Candela on some rocks from the uh, Ptolemy and Truth Suite out in Yosemite. He left for what he thought were greener scientific pastures and went to uh, Dr. Walker's former university, SUNY Stony Brook, where he completed a master's degree. He went into private in industry for a short bit. Um, as I recall, he came back to a Christmas party that the department had. And uh, shortly after that Christmas party, he was re-enrolled in a PhD, well, he was re-enrolled in graduate school PhD program here at Maryland. He finished here at Maryland in 2003, worked in our research group with Phil Candell and myself. He became a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, where he was responsible for, as I recall, the logistics of sending scientists to Antarctica. Shortly after that, um, he went off to a Penrose conference out in uh, Yellowstone in Butte, Montana. And at that conference, Adam gave a talk right before a break. And Adam went a little long. For those of you that know Adam, know that he likes to talk. And a faculty member named Steve Kessler walked up at the end and said, Adam, it doesn't matter that you went over. There's really only one talk that it's important you are on time. And that is when you're trying to get a job. I'll come back to that. Adam got a job at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, was there for several years and then moved on to the University of Michigan where he now holds Steve Kessler's position who has since retired. Adam's co-author of two books, one on mineral resources with Steve Kessler and another on earth materials with Dexter Perkins and several others. He's the Arthur Thurnell Professor of Earth and Environmental Science. Um, and that is an award given out by the University of Michigan for faculty members for their outstanding duty to students, both academically and outside of the classroom. So with that, I present you, Adam, welcome back. Yeah, so thank you. That makes it actually sound like I've done something good since 1995. Um, I'm going to share, I think I can share my screen and show you some slides. Yep, that's running. Uh, I, I, I put some in here at the beginning and I'll admit there are lots of slides and I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front. I don't anticipate to dwell on some of the slides. I'll just use them to give you a snapshot of the research that we've been doing since I got to Michigan in 2012 and 13. And some other bits and pieces in here that I find interesting. And of course, that means you're going to find them interesting. So here's a title which really doesn't matter. And here's my name and middle initial. And I, I first of all want to give credit to a lot of collaborators. So I've been really fortunate in the last decade to work with two faculty from the University of Chile here, top right, and lots of graduate students here on the left side at the University of Michigan that I've advised and four graduate students at the University of Chile in Santiago, and a number of collaborators here on the bottom who have provided us access to their labs to produce data. I dug through some old photographs and found some here back when I had a lot more hair lower right. And I think that's a Triceratops, which was one of the geology club's t-shirts. That was a picture I took in the summer of 1994 when I had just completed field camp at New Mexico Tech. And prior to that field camp, I thought I wanted to do a senior thesis with Karen Prestigard. I went to field camp and met a guy named Andy Campbell, who had been an office mate of Phil Candela when they were both PhD students at Harvard in the late 1970s working with Dick Holland. And Andy told me, when you get back, you should knock on this guy's door. I hadn't met Phil Candela. I think he was in Australia on sabbatical the previous year. Knocked on Phil Candela's door, and it was probably, I've told Phil this, probably one of those great moments of, apart from proposing and when your kids are born. Knocked on Phil's door, went inside, and I can remember him pulling out a ream of computer paper and going into a long philosophical conversation about geology, economic geology, how it benefits society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for those of you who don't know, Phil was effectively an undergraduate philosophy and geology major at Queens College back in the day and did my undergraduate and came back and finished my PhD along the way. We had two kids. I can remember standing with this kid right here, James, when he just started his undergraduate college now and he's 6'5 and 200 pounds and towers over me. And Abigail just started graduate school, uh, med school at Ohio State University two weeks ago. But this was my PhD graduation in uh, 2003. 
was very fortunate to meet Phil and Phil, the two Phil's as we've long called them and you have probably as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanna make sure I give them the credit that's due and others as well. I remember Mike Brown one time catching me as an undergraduate on the front steps of the geology building. And I think he was looking at undergraduate GPAs. He came outside and he said, well, yours is a little above 3.1. I guess you're okay. So I think I've done okay. As, as Phil mentioned at the University of Michigan, I stepped into the shoes of a, an emeritus professor, Steve Kessler, who had a long distinguished career here. I've published a couple of textbooks. I teach these classes at the bottom, Introduction to Earth Science or Intro Geology. I've gotten really interested in energy, sustainable energy, fossil energy, and as well, natural resources, economics, and the environment is the other upper division class that I teach, uh, owing to an interest that I would say Phil Candela really stimulated 25 years ago in not just understanding the geology of mineral resources, but also understanding the economics that impact the mineability of those natural resources and their trade around the world and how they impact society from bottom to top. So when I teach classes on campus, this is one of the images I show the very first day. And I do it in a way to try and remind students that they've learned a lot of jargon, they've memorized a lot of facts, but they've probably never had a class that actually contextualized natural resources in a way that really makes them appreciate not just how we use natural resources, but why we use natural resources. And I always do a lot of in-class think, pair, share, and I put these questions up at the top. And the students pretty quickly exhaust that list after maybe 15 or 20 seconds. When you look at the photographs here of dioramas from I think the American Museum of Natural History that I took, you know, you've got animal skins, you've got wood, you've got basic fire, but the list of natural resources, including food that they would have either hunted or picked locally, you know, it might be a couple dozen at tops. And then I show this image, which all four of my kids now, my youngest just started as a freshman in high school. You see this in sixth grade in the state of Michigan. And you, you probably have a sixth grade teacher who makes this about as boring as it could possibly be, talking about the transition from the Stone Age to the Copper Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, and doesn't contextualize it. And I spend a lot of time in the first lectures in my classes going backwards in time to contextualize resources and how they make us who we are. I have read the Old Testament. And even if you do not practice conventional religion, you're an atheist, the Old Testament, you can really look at it as an historical text. And when you read the Old Testament, you will find in the Old Testament what we call the seven metals of antiquity, shown here next to the dates when we know humans started using them for specific purposes, gold, copper, silver, tin, lead, iron, and mercury. All of these are mentioned in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And I remind students that it's always important to think about when, why, where, and how we use different resources and how they have shaped the human race as we know it and how they relate to geologic or geographic expansion as well as colonization, which we know now in, in light of a lot of the Black Lives Matter issues that have surfaced recently but certainly have been pervasive throughout society for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Natural resources, when you think about them in a historical context, they put places on a map, literally. So if you look at this image here, and I'll trace over some of the places with my cursor of ancient Anatolia or modern day Turkey, Mesopotamia, where you learned about the Tigris and Euphrates River in sixth grade ge geography. If you look at each one of these symbols here, it represents a mine, it represents a specific geologic place on the map where human beings recognized the physical outcropping of rocks that in this case contain native silver, native copper. They contain tin oxide, which was relatively easy to smelt in order to get tin metal. And this is among the reasons that humans expanded in the ways that we did. It's among the reasons that we established what we now have and think of as global trading networks. And it was all in the pursuit of finding one or more resources that would enable us to improve our living conditions. So here is an example of native copper, which has this classic green patina. And we, we know that copper and gold were the first metals used by humans. The reason that they dug these tunnels is because the surface of these rocks showed this beautiful green patina which was an indicator almost 4,000 years ago to those humans that behind that green patina could be native copper 
and native copper is a metal that can be beaten and formed into tools. And the reason that humans use tools or the reason that we ideated tools as well as some, member, some other members of the animal species is tools allow us to do work to reduce the overall amount of human labor that's necessary. So for thousands of years, we've been doing this type of work and the tools that were made in this particular location at Great Orme, they were used to dig tunnels that run for five miles beneath the surface. Nothing modern, no electricity, no diesel electric shovel, shovels. They were simply digging by hand using tools that they fabricated from the resources they could find in their local environment. And we can see these in museums around the world. We have entire academic disciplines where we can see these and we can look at them and they give us insight into how the human mind, how collectively the human mind changed over thousands of years as we went from nomads to hunter gatherers to societies that were built around cities and enclaves where tools became fundamental to sustenance. We have these ingots that represent the oldest exportable copper during the late Calcolithic. And we know that these ingots were exported from England across at that time, Gaul and other parts of Europe. So we're establishing trade among peoples that had very different levels or methods of communication. We go from the Copper Age to the Bronze Age, which you can really think of as prehistoric chemistry. And what was it? It was the observation that early humans made that copper melts at a very high temperature, tin melts at a very low temperature, but if you mix copper and tin at just the right ratio, seven parts copper, three parts tin, eight parts copper, two parts tin, you lower the melting point of that binary alloy in such a way that is shown bottom right, that alloy becomes a liquid at a much lower temperature than the higher melting temperature of copper. And we see images here on the left of ancient Sumerians who were among the first to figure out how to smelt. So how could they mix mechanically copper and tin and then blow air or the oxygen in air into a fire in such a way that they could achieve a high enough temperature to melt. And this allowed us to transition from the copper to the Bronze Age. And then we have Bronze Age tools and we continued into the Iron Age all the way to the modern age. And when we think about metal resources, historically they put places on the map and they continue to do so. So the image you're looking at here is from the US Geological Survey where they have done a GIS spatial analysis of all operating or non-operating mines around the world of all different types. And one of the things that you can see here is if you think about the image I showed you of the ancient Middle East, Anatolia, Mesopotamia, the resources around the world in these countries have driven humans to explore for, and in many cases, they have imposed upon local communities by way of colonization and environmental degradation, many problems that I know we're cleaning up today. So please don't think that I'm preaching the choir here that what Europeans did by searching for metals is all wonderful. But I'll leave you with a few slides at the end and ask you if you'd rather go backwards in time to living naked in a cave and just picture the faculty and what that would look like for class. If we look at how much resources we use today, I'm gonna show you a few slides now that are the same where the bottom axis is time from 1960 to about 2013 when I compiled these data for our textbook. And on the Y axis is the change in production where 1960 represents zero. Now production, when we think about it from a mining perspective, mining companies are not hoarding metals, they're not hoarding resources. So production here is equal to global consumption. When companies mine iron ore, the goal is to sell it within that calendar year or that fiscal year, get that revenue return and continue mining operations. So if we look at iron, which is really the backbone for modern society, iron is what we have used to build our electric infrastructure in terms of the scaffolding that we use for aluminum and copper lines. It's the infrastructure here we have, it's the skeleton of all skyscrapers in most places around the world, certainly in the developed world, the, the codes require that anything above five stories must include steel and concrete because wood does not have the strength to support floors higher than five. So we use steel. So if we look at steel since 1960, we currently consume about 450% more than we did in 1960. If we look at copper, 
we consume about 300% more copper per year than we did in 1960. And I'll highlight here that copper is among the metals fundamental to our electricity infrastructure. If we think about any way of transmitting electricity around the world, whether or not we're using fossil fuels as a source of energy or we're using wind turbines or solar panels, copper is absolutely involved because of its ability to transmit electricity and not undergo or be resistant to chemical weathering. When we look at rare earth elements, these are the ones that have gone off the chart. I can remember in 1993 at Maryland, no, it wasn't 1993, when I started doing my senior thesis with the Phils, it was August of 1994 and Candela told me to get an email address so that we could use that to communicate. And an email in 1994 was radically, I mean, it was progressive. We didn't have the smartphones that we have now that connect us instantaneously to the Library of Congress. Rare earth metals, if we go from 1960 to today, we use about 5,000 more percent rare earth metals every year than we did in 1960. And it's because in 1960, we effectively had no products that relied on rare earth metals, but rare earths are fundamental to every form of technology today. They make electric vehicles possible. They make smartphones possible. They make tablets possible. When we look at the magnets in wind turbines, we know that each wind turbine requires about 4,000 kilograms or four tons of copper. We also have those magnets, the permanent magnets that are based on neodymium. And we know that neodymium is a metal that is in right now desperate need of domestic supply because our Department of Defense is responsible for about 8% of rare earth imports to the United States. So these slides are just meant to convey to you how much more we consume relative to our parents and grandparents. So now I wanna transition to giving you a synopsis about some of the mineral systems that we've been working on over the last seven or eight years. And I've got up at the top two different names for two different mineral systems. One is referred to as iron oxide copper gold or often abbreviated IOCG deposits. And the second are these iron oxide apatite deposits or often abbreviated IOA. And we've known about iron oxide apatite deposits likely for hundreds of years. There's evidence we were mining them throughout Europe going back hundreds if not thousands of years. Iron oxide copper gold is a relatively new mineral system only discovered in the late 1970s. And all I wanna show you on this map is just continuing that theme of putting a place on the map. These types of ore deposits are increasingly sought after as sources of their namesake metals, iron, copper, gold, but also appetite because it hosts rare earth elements. And so mining companies are incredibly interested in understanding how these deposits form, what we refer to as a genetic model. If they have a good working genetic model, then they can use that to improve exploration strategies around the world to find new sources of resource to satisfy our growing hunger. These are interesting deposits in that they form throughout geologic time. So the y-axis here is age, the x-axis is, can't see mine, is yeah, tonnage, reported resource in millions of tons is the MT. And so if you look here, the colored diamonds are for copper and the empty diamonds are for iron. And all I wanna emphasize is unlike some other ore deposits, for example, banded iron formations, we only find before the great oxidation event. Porphyry type ore deposits, which the fills have worked on for most of their career, we tend to only find those in the Phanerozoic. So IOCG and IOA deposits are interesting for a number of reasons. Among them, they seem to have formed throughout Earth's history when we had very different levels of oxygen in the atmosphere, the oceans, the crust, and the mantle. So just a little bit of brief background on iron oxide copper gold deposits. These are really large tonnage deposits, tens to thousands of millions of tons of ore. And in each of them, magnetite is the modally dominant mineral. The image on the top left here is a, is a cross section through the Manto Verde IOCG deposit in Chile. And I'm highlighting here with the arrow what's known as the Manto Verde fault, which runs here. And you can see the black below the fault is magnetite. The red above the fault in the hanging wall is hematite. And what makes this and all IOCG deposits mineable is the copper in minerals such as chalcopyrite and bornite. So without that copper, these deposits don't have high enough grade iron to be mined. It's only the copper. And there are also a number of byproduct metals that mining companies are interested in. 
Modally, iron always dominates over copper, which dominates over gold. And they have a lot of similarities in terms of their total grade and tonnage to porphyry copper deposits. It's copper that makes them economic. Relative to porphyry copper deposits, they're sulfur poor. There is evidence in all districts that IOCG deposits are coeval with igneous activity. They're hosted in igneous and sedimentary rocks, but there has been a lot of controversy over the last few decades as to how they actually formed. Are they magmatic deposits? Are they magmatic hydrothermal deposits such as porphyry gold or porphyry copper deposits? Are they formed by basinal brines or conate fluids? Are they formed by metamorphic fluids? We know that mineralization is always structurally controlled. And so there's a lot of complex geology here that we try to use in collaboration with mining companies to understand how does the deposit form so you can effectively write a recipe or a genetic model for how that deposit, and then as a group, how all similar mineral deposits form. If we then look at iron oxide apatite deposits, they're often in the literature written as Karuna type deposits because the namesake locale for these is in Karuna in Northern Sweden. And this is the cross section through the Karuna deposit. And if you look here, they are also fault hosted. So here I'm tracing over the ore body and you can see that the ore body is constrained within a fault that intersects the surface. And the ore by the late 1700s was being mined by the Swedes. And the numbers up here at the top indicate the paleo surface at 1900, 1910, 1920, 30, 40, 50, 65, et cetera. And then by the mid 1960s, they started underground mining. And this particular deposit at Karuna is currently the largest iron producer in the European Union. Historically, it was only mined for iron, but it does contain appetite. And appetite, while historically that was simply landfilled, for lack of a better way to describe it, put in piles on site and not, not used for anything, because it is rare earth element rich, the mining companies now are reassessing the rare earth resources in the waste piles. These deposits are also large, tens to thousands of millions of tons. Magnetite dominates anywhere from 60 to more than 90 volume percent. The iron grades and total tonnage are similar to porphyry copper deposits. And in this deposit type, iron makes them economic. So in IOCGs, it's copper. In IOAs, it's iron. These are also sulfur poor relative to porphyry copper systems. So they do bear some similarities to porphyry copper, but they have orders of magnitude less sulfur. And in the literature, magnetite has always been reported to be titanium poor. They're also coeval with igneous activity. They're also hosted dominantly in igneous rocks, sometimes in sedimentary rocks, but mostly igneous rocks. They're commonly found in subduction zone environments, and I should have mentioned so are IOCGs. And these deposits are also structurally controlled. If I put the two side by side, in 2013, this is really what stimulated my interest to get into understanding the genesis of these particular mineral systems. When you look at IOCG and IOA deposits, there's a lot of similarities between the two different deposit types. They're both sulfur poor. They're both coeval with igneous activity. They're both associated with subduction zone igneous processes. And it occurred to me to start looking into the mineral chemistry of magnetite, which is something I had focused on both for a master's degree with Don Lindsley at Stony Brook, and also looking at magnetite solubility in silicate melts and magmatic hydrothermal fluids with the two fills for part of my PhD. And at that time, it was simply exploratory. It was probably a moment of boredom to try and figure out what we know about the magnetite in these systems and what might it tell us about how each of these two systems formed. That led me to start the collaboration with Martin Reich and Fernanda Barro at the University of Chile, because I saw this map on the right-hand side where all of the deposits in red are IOA deposits, so iron oxide apatite. All of the deposits in green are iron oxide, copper, gold, or IOCG. And what you can see is all of the black lines here. These are all faults or fault splays off the main Atacama fault system, which runs roughly trench parallel to the subduction zone in Chile up into Peru. And what you can see is that all of the deposits are proximal or hosted within either the main Atacama fault system or a fault splay off the Atacama system. And you'd look at this and think, 
well, okay, what it clearly shows is that the, the iron oxide appetite, they're spatially somewhat close to iron oxide appetite, but they don't overlap. Until you start looking deep into the literature, and in this case, looking at theses of students in Chile and Peru who have worked on these deposits, some of Mark Barton's students at the University of Arizona, and you look at structural reconstructions of individual deposits, and I'll just highlight on the left-hand side, what I then found was in particular deposits like Kelso here, there were reports that shallow level mineralization would be copper rich or iron oxide copper gold, and that deeper drill core revealed a transition to iron oxide appetite mineralization in such a way that you can draw what we've drawn on the right-hand side, a hypothetical cross-section through what could be one system where at the top of the system, we have iron oxide, copper, gold mineralization and transitioning with depth, we have iron oxide, copper, gold, iron oxide, appetite. And with increasing depth, the system becomes an iron oxide appetite deposit such that when we're looking at any one particular deposit now exposed or outcropping at the surface, if we see an iron oxide appetite deposit, it is possible that the iron oxide, copper, gold deposit has been weathered away. If we're looking at an iron oxide copper gold deposit that outcrops, then it's possible there's an iron oxide appetite deposit at depth. And remembering that all of these deposits, both deposit types are structurally controlled, fault hosted, except for the upper parts of IOCG deposits where the evidence indicates that ore fluids percol out, percolated out into the host rocks. So we, we came up together with this crazy idea in 2013-14 that maybe these things are geologically connected. And then we realized one of the gurus in our field, Dick Silito, had apparently come up with a similar idea, but hadn't really chased it. He just sort of put that out there as a testable hypothesis. There are lots of models that explain these deposits. I'm not gonna go into those in detail. I'd be happy to discuss with those of you who are interested, but I just wanna point out that geologists working on these systems, they have each come up with a unique model that satisfies the formation of one particular deposit. But a big criticism has been that no one has come up with a unifying model that explains the geology of iron oxide appetite and iron oxide copper gold deposits within and among districts on six continents where these have been or are currently being mined. So when you look in the literature about magnetite, I, I can give you the brief synopsis. There was almost nothing. Despite the fact that magnetite dominates modally both deposit types, there was literally almost nothing in the literature. Nobody had gone in and actually done high resolution, detailed analyses of magnetite grains in any of these deposits. The reported magnetite chemistry would be one-offs. It would be a thin section with a spot analysis here and a spot analysis here and a spot analysis over here. We've got three, that's the statistical minimum. We can calculate a standard deviation no matter how shitty it is. Look, we've got a paper. But we found almost no data and we thought, well, gee, if these are deposits that involve significant quantities of magnetite, we know that magnetite also always incorporates other trace and minor elements. What could the chemistry of magnetite tell us about the formation of these deposits? So just a little background on magnetite. Magnetite has the inverse spinel structure with the chemical formula shown up here at the top. And everyone here listening today remembers magnetite as the easiest mineral you could get on your mineralogy exam as an undergraduate because it's magnetic and it looks nothing like pyrotite, which is also slightly magnetic. And all I wanna highlight here is that within magnetite, you have both octahedral sites that accommodate ferric and ferrous iron and you have tetrahedral sites that only accommodate ferric iron. And the reason that's important is that if you look here at the two chart, the two images on the bottom, where we've got charge on the y-axis and ionic radius on the x-axis, if you look at the circles here, what I'm showing you, and this is not my work, but what I'm showing you from a paper by Patrick Nadal et al, published in 2014, is that both the octahedral and tetrahedral sites in magnetite accommodate a wide range of minor and trace elements beyond simply titanium, which a lot of us might be familiar with when we talk about titanomagnetite or magnetite ilmenite intergrowths or exolution of ilmenite from magnetite. And so what I just want you to take away here is that the tetrahedral site can accommodate a lot of three plus cations. 
And the octahedral site can accommodate two plus, three plus, and four plus cations. And remember from undergraduate geochemistry that one of the things this might allow you to do as well is possibly develop a geothermometer because we know that minerals incorporate more trace elements on average at higher temperature where the lattices can vibrate and, and have more wiggle room for um, cations other than the essential structural constituents that make that particular mineral, in this case, iron, what it is. There had been some work published in 2014 on that topic. And on the bottom left here, I'm showing you what has been known, well, what's called now the magnetite discrimination diagram, where we've got aluminum plus, mag man aluminum plus manganese plotted against titanium plus vanadium, so the sum of the concentrations of each. And there was a group from the USGS that noticed some similarity in the composition of magnetite from porphyry copper deposits, IOCG deposits, Karuna deposits, over here, we've got iron titanium vanadium deposits like Stillwater and Bushfeld, banded iron formation deposits over here. And on the right, they used fluid inclusion data in coeval quartz and calcite to put this line on here for decreasing temperature. So they suggested possibly magnetite chemistry could be used as a thermometer. And also magnetite chemistry, if you were sampling this in detrital sediment, you could actually use it as a way to explore or ascertain what ore deposits might exist upstream as you were sampling in a particular terrain. So we started this work in 2013 by visiting this deposit where I show you a picture of the open pit on the right-hand side. This is the Los Colorados iron oxide apatite deposit. And on the map over here on the left, in white is the city of Vianar in coastal uh, Chile, about an hour flight north from Santiago. And Los Colorados is here about a 20 minute drive north of Vianar. And if you look at the photograph where we've got the open pit and all of the benches, and you can see the truck here on the right hand side and the trucks here in the center left, the scale bar is a kilometer. Oh, this area that's rusted here that I'm tracing out, that is the location of what was a fault bound iron oxide apatite deposit that extended across the open pit. And so from the surface, they have mined down into that fault bound deposit. It's a Cretaceous deposit as are all of the deposits in this part of Chile. It's hosted in volcanic and volcanoclastic rocks. And it has a reserve of 350 million tons of iron, which is a huge deposit. And the deposit is 90% magnetite. I mean, it's literally a magnetite rock that has 350 million tons of iron. And we were able to spend time working with mine geologists to sample both the main ore bodies. So now we're looking at a plan view map on the left where you can see all of the open pit is here. And we're looking here at two colors, red and green. And the red indicates iron concentrations of 63%. The blue indicate, well, the red on the right side is 55%. Um, and the blue is up to 5% magnetite. In this particular deposit, the Los Colorados Fault, it strikes north, northeast, and all of the mineralization is hosted within the Los Colorados Fault, which is a district scale fault that is a splay off the main Atacama Fault system. In terms of this deposit, this mineralization is about 1500 meters long. Each one of these ore bodies, if I go back one here, maybe, I guess not. Oh, all right, we'll stick with this one. Um, is about 90 to 180 meters width and about 500 meters uh, um, thickness or depth. And we were simply fascinated. How could nature form 90% magnetite in one particular small part of a fault in this particular part of Chile? And there's a district of these deposits. So we sampled drill core from this deposit, both from the main ore bodies and also disseminated ore in the host diorite. And I'm just gonna give you a highlight of some of the things that jumped off the page. And for the graduate students out there, I'll tell you that I had a graduate student, Yika Knipping working on this in early 2014. As a graduate student, you should always have an oh shit moment. I'm reminded of a story. I'm pretty sure this is right. I don't know if Farquhar is on the Zoom call today, but Farquhar told me at one point in time when he was at DTM, he thought he broke the mass spec. And the next thing he knew, he figured out mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes. My graduate student came upstairs and just couldn't believe what she was looking at. And what she had seen on the microprobe 
So on the bottom left here, well, top left, this is a backscattered electron image of magnetite from the Los Colorados deposit. And then we've got WDFK alpha maps for iron and magnesium and silicon here, top right. And I've blown the one up for titanium. What she noticed in every sample from this particular deposit is that the magnetite grains were systematically zoned. They had what I've labeled here, these zone ones that you can see in the BSE images. They are riddled with inclusions and I'll explain what those are in a few slides. They also are enriched in titanium. And the systematic zonation is such that the zone one or the core of magnetite grains are titanium rich. They then transition to what we've labeled a zone two where titanium concentrations within a zone are relatively constant, homogeneous, but systematically lower than titanium contents in zone one. And then depending on the magnetite grains, you can have these zones three or zone four that overgrow zone two. And so Yika spent months, depending on how much time she could get on our microprobe, investigating the chemistry of these magnetite grains. And then she plotted all of her data on this trace element magnetite discriminant diagram, aluminum plus manganese versus titanium plus vanadium. And again, this was an attempt by researchers at the USGS in Denver to bin magnetite chemistry into specific geologic environments. Here's where all the magnetite from porphyry deposits form. Here's the box for all magnetite from Karuna. On this side of this black line, all magnetite from the Bushveld should plot over here. All magnetite from IOCGs over here. And, and sort of the old shit moment was, look at this. The data for this magnetite grain on the right-hand side, zone one plots up here consistent with the chemistry of magnetite grown from a silicate melt, such as Bushfeld or Stillwater. Zone two, the chemistry plots right here, smack dab in the middle of the porphyry box, not the Karuna box, even though this is literally a Karuna type iron oxide apatite deposit. And it's only zone three that plots down here in the Karuna box. And when you look at this and you see this trend systematically, where you've got the bulk analysis would be here, in the center here, and then you tease apart the composition from core to rim, the first thing this tells you is that whole rock analyses here are a complete waste of time when you're trying to understand the evolution of this system. And it's because a whole rock analysis would give you this one, one beach ball here in black and white. It's only when you go in and do really high resolution, high resolution transects across magnetite grains, avoiding inclusions, that you see this beautiful trend and what that trend tells us about the ore deposit in which it's hosted. So I mentioned that zone one had these inclusions. Well, Yaika spent time on, we have a high temperature heating freezing stage that's capable of heating minerals up to 1400 degrees. And Yaika spent a lot of time doing what we would call blind rehomogenization. So I know Megan who's on here has done, I think you've done homogenization of olivine hosted melt inclusions or that's certainly within your, your sphere of expertise. With magnetite, remember, it is an opaque mineral. So you have to use reflected light or BSE imaging to study magnetite. You can't see through it with conventional transparent microscopes. So what Yaika did to try and understand what these inclusions are is she took magnetite grains, put them on our heating stage, and on the top left here, she heated it to 750 degrees, let it sit for a few hours, and then turned off the temperature. And then she would look at it on the SEM. She then repeated that at 800 degrees and she would look at it on the SEM. And she did this iteratively until she found out that at temperatures above 875, but below 975 within magnetite, which is the gray host here, these unknown inclusions, they actually become liquid, which means that they were trapped as a melt. So now we have the cores of magnetite, these zone ones, where within magnetite, within those cores, there are melt inclusions that have the composition of an intermediate to slightly mafic silicate liquid, which was wild because nobody had reported these before to our knowledge. Yaika then did some work with Chris Heinrich's group at Etaha and Zurich. So here you're looking at, if you look at the bottom, this is a reflected light image of a magnetite grain here on the bottom. All the orange is magnetite. The blue on the right-hand side is the epoxy. And what you're looking at here, I'll trace it, just above the 404 microns is a 404 micron transect where we hold the laser steady 
and we translate the sample at a constant rate. So we know the depth of ablation as we move the sample under the laser beam. And the laser excavates the material in the magnetite, feeds that into this case, a quadrupole mass spec, ICPMS. And here I'm just showing you counts for each of the individual elements that I highlight in, uh, in boxes here versus time. So you've got the classic gas background here where you're just measuring the gas background going into your mass spec. And then you start ablating the sample. And what we noticed in the data is iron is effectively constant. It's a magnetite grain. But we started to see that elements like sodium and potassium and magnesium, we would see these peaks. All of a sudden we're ablating and we would see these peaks. Or we would see other peaks. And we started to think, well, what other types of inclusion could be hosted within magnetite? And it turns out within magnetite, we've identified both silicate melt inclusions in zone one, and we've identified in zone two fluid inclusions. So down here, bottom left is the same image, and zone one here, this is the trace element enriched part of that magnetite grain that contains silicate melt inclusions. And in zone two, I'm showing you here on the right a number of images taken with uh, EDX maps on our field emission SEM, where the top left BSE image, the host in all of these is magnetite. So that's the gray out here. This is a small inclusion. And within that inclusion, there are two what we interpret to be crystals. And we very carefully polished this, not using water, but we reached out to Bob Bodner and others and got really good advice about how to polish this so that you don't introduce a contaminant. And I'll just highlight, look at the image top left, jump down to the bottom left and you see chlorine, you see top right sodium. This is a crystal of sodium chloride. And what we know from many decades of studies of fluid inclusions trapped in minerals is that when you have a fluid inclusion trapped in a mineral that contains halite crystals, those halite crystals are what we refer to as daughter crystals meaning that when this inclusion was originally trapped, magnetite was growing in the presence of a hydrothermal aqueous solution. Magnetite overgrew that solution, so it traps part of that solution to form a fluid inclusion. It's doing this at some elevated pressure and temperature. The pressure inside the inclusion remains fixed depending on what pressure the mineral grew. The temperature though is initially high, and as the temperature drops, in this case, the solubility of halite decreases with decreasing temperature. And so halite crystals nucleate at about 26 to 35 weight percent NaCl, depending on the complexity of the fluid inclusion. So what we were able to find and document here is zone two contains halite saturated fluid inclusions, which tell us that this zone two magnetite grew in the presence or grew from a fluid that contained at least, if not more than 35 weight percent NaCl equivalent, which this simply means we have a variety of other halide complex uh, cations in, in the fluid inclusion. Well, we then had another student in our group who we decided to throw something else new at the project, which was, was at the time relatively new, and that is iron isotopes. So here I'm showing you on the left-hand side, a BSE image of a thin section where we've got magnetite, coeval with apatite, coeval with actinolite, all intimately intergrown. And what you can see is on the y-axis, we have iron isotopes and the x-axis oxygen isotopes. And what we know from decades of study is that all iron, when you measure the abundance of iron, iron isotopes in minerals such as magnetite, all magnetite that grew from a silicate liquid or a magmatic hydrothermal fluid in iron oxygen and, and oxid, in iron isotope and oxygen isotope space, it should plot within this box. And what we found is that all the magnetite from this particular deposit plotted in that box, which led us to interpret the iron and oxygen as fingerprinting the source of both iron and oxygen in this particular system. So we've got Magnetite, where we have melt inclusions in the core, fluid inclusions in the rims. We've got iron and oxygen isotopes that are consistent with a magmatic or magmatic hydrothermal fluid reservoir. 
We've also done hydrogen isotopes in magnetite and actinolite, and those are consistent with mantle values. We've done a lot of work on pyrite that I'm gonna skip over, and we've got a few papers in press that report that. But then we started turning to candelaria because we, uh, another deposit. So this is the candelaria IOCG deposit, also in Chile. So on the left-hand side, we've got the city of Vianar, we've got the Los Colorados deposit. And then if you move up north, here's another city, Copiapó, about a two hour flight north of Santiago and Candelaria. And it is one of several IOCG deposits in the Punta del Cobre district within this area. And just to give you a brief synopsis, it's almost identical to Los Colorados. You can see on the left here and the right in these cross sections, that you've got mineralization that is fault bound, identical to Manto Verde, identical to Los Colorados. In the image on the right, in stippled, the red lines here, you can see what is the target because this is now a copper deposit. And I just wanna highlight all of this dark black, that's all magnetite. It's all 80 to 90 to 95% modal magnetite. So we have done a lot of work here. And just to give you the highlights, all of the chemistry from this deposit pretty much looks identical to the chemistry from the Los Colorados deposit, except the difference being that we were given access in this deposit to dr drill core that span a thousand meters depth. So the drill core starts in the shallow IOCG mineralization and it extends a thousand meters below that mineralization. And the most amazing find was, I'll highlight it over here on the right, in the deeper part of the system, the magnetite chemistry is identical to magnetite from igneous intrusions like the Bushveld and other iron oxide apatite deposits. We've done iron isotopes on Candelaria and we see the same story. The majority of the data fall within this blue box that fingerprint and igneous origin for iron and oxygen, except where you have some samples where the isotopes clearly indicate mixing. We've also recently started doing triple oxygen isotopes. So oxygen 17 is the least abundant of the three oxygen isotopes. And I'll just give you the highlight of this here because we've got this coming out in a paper. This box here that I'm tracing in cap delta 17 versus conventional small delta 018, all of our samples overlap oxygen 16, 17, 18 when you convert them to cap delta and lower delta ratios that are consistent with orthomagmatic magnetite. So the summary for all of this, which I think I've covered, but I'll just hold on for a second here. The summary was no existing model could explain this. There was no existing model in the literature that we could find that could actually explain the observations that we, we saw. Or I guess the observations that we made. So we came up with a new model, which is something geologists love to do, right? Lots of arm waving. And here's the model in a nutshell. We came up with a model that explains the formation of iron oxide apatite, iron oxide copper gold deposits as part of a single continuum that is directly connected to intermediate to mafic magmas at depth, which we have yet to drill in. No mining company drills deep enough that we can actually sample these. And all of this, I'm gonna lay out here. So on the left-hand side in the next few slides, I've got a box where the orange is silicate melt and black is magnetite. And we looked through the literature at the time in 2014, early 2015, and we found evidence from the literature from experimental studies that in intermediate to slightly mafic silicate melts, as they cool, magnetite is either the liquidus or near liquidus phase at 200 MPa, which would be equivalent to a crustal depth of give or take seven to eight kilometers. In the bottom right, I'm showing you an SE image, SEM image from one of the magnetite, or it's a bunch of magnetite grains from Los Colorados. And I just wanna highlight what's shown here with the white arrows. These are all of those magnetite cores that are very titanium rich. And if you look at the scale bar, the size of these cores are consistent with microlites and nanolites that have been studied extensively by people in the volcanology community. So you look at research by Julie Hammer and others where they're very interested in the nucleation kinetics of, uh, of microphenocrysts or microlites. The model that we came up with is as follows. We have an intermediate to slightly mafic silicate melt, think andesite or basaltic andesite that ponds in the upper crust. And as it cools, magnetite is the liquidus phase. 
This allows magnetite to grow in the presence of a silicate melt and trap melt inclusions. It also explains the chemistry shown here for these zone ones of magnetite. As the andesitic melt or basaltic andesitic melt continues to crystallize, remember magnetite is the liquidus phase. We know this from experiments and also melts modeling. The melt will reach volatile saturation. Now this is a part we're still working on, but when the melt reaches volatile saturation, there is what we refer to as homogeneous versus heterogeneous nucleation of volatile bubbles within a melt. And what had been shown in the literature, this was a study by Shaul Hurwitz and Oded Navon in 94 in GCA, is that in the case of this is a rhyolitic melt here, this is a magnetite grain. When a, when a silicate melt exalves a volatile phase, the lowest free energy for that bubble to exolve is if it exolves by nucleating and growing on the surface of a magnetite crystal. And it turns out now we know that can also happen on silicates such as pyroxenes and plagioclase and other feldspars. And so if you look at this image on the right, what Hurwitz and Navon showed is that as a melt cools, magnetize the liquidus phase, continues to cool, reaches water saturation, the bubbles, as I show here schematically on the left, nucleate on magnetite. Now, that means now we have magnetite growing in the presence of what is we, what we call a magmatic mm -hmm. hydrothermal fluid. And magmatic hydrothermal fluids are great scavengers of metals such as iron and copper and gold and rare earths among others. And there had been some work done. So the, let me get ahead of myself. The chemistry here also is consistent with these zone twos. And there had been some great work done by um, uh, Mark Yorso and uh, Gil Gualda, who's now at Vanderbilt, or I guess he's been at Vanderbilt for a while. So ignore all the equations here. All I want you to take away is they had done work on some samples from the Bishop Tuff, and they had put out a model that suggested that magnetite, when it serves as the nucleation site for these bubbles, those bubbles and magnetite, the magnetite is very small, right? It, it's nanometer to micron scale. So these microlites, they can form a discrete phase within the silicate melt. And as long as the volume proportion of magnetite in that bubble magnetite aggregate is less than 37%, the magnetite bubble aggregate can ascend or gravitationally float up through the melt. So we love this. I, I thought this is amazing because now we've got a way to connect in these systems, magnetite bottom left that initially grows from a silicate melt and traps melt inclusions. The silicate melt then reaches volatile saturation. The magnetite is where the, the volatile phase bubbles nucleate and grow. They sweep up that magnetite. So now you can grow these zone twos. Zone two, remember, contains fluid inclusions, these hypersaline fluid inclusions. And the bulk density of that magnetite fluid suspension is lower than the average density of the magma. So it has the ability to ascend provided that there are permeable pathways for it to rise. And it explains all of these chemical features of Los Colorados and lots of other deposits that we've looked at. So as, with happens, as, as happens with all models, we got totally shit on at a bunch of conferences. We had, we had some really good reviews and some torturous reviews. And so the next step was to, to test this in the lab because a lot of people said, that sounds great, back of the envelope, you can calculate whatever you want, but actually demonstrate that it happens. So I'll just show you here a little bit of a synopsis of the experiments we did, where in each of these image, imagine an experiment in Phil's lab or Megan's lab, where the top and the bottom here, this is the top of a capsule wall, and this is the bottom of a capsule wall. We melted an andesite at the condition shown here on the right-hand side, and then we decompressed it. And we decompressed it and held it for different periods of time. So we went to 250 MPA, we made it 100% liquid, and we quenched and we know that. And what happens in natural systems when you have a silicate liquid and magnetite crystallizes, the silicate liquid has a density of three, magnetite's got a density of five-ish, magnetite would sink. And the bottom left is a cartoon that tells us that's exactly what should happen. But this is a volatile undersaturated silicate melt. And in fact, here, we show that after three days, magnetite sinks after decompression. We then repeated the experiments, but decompressed 
such that the melt exolved a volatile phase. So the image here from a transparent scope on the right, the melt here is an andesite in yellow. All of these are bubbles that you see and magnetite grains. What we found in this case is just like Shaw Hurwitz and Oded Navone had shown and what Giorso um, and, and his colleagues had shown, we had experimental evidence that as an andesite cools and crystallizes, magnetite is the liquidus phase. As it continues to cool, it reaches water saturation. Bubbles nucleate on magnetite. And look at the image on the top left now. The top is still the top, the bottom is still the bottom. Now we see the inverse of what I showed you before. In this case, magnetite is abundant at the top of the melt, even though magnetite is more dense than the melt. And the only way to explain this, unless you invoke the omnipotent woman who's up in the sky looking down at us and laughing at how long it takes us to figure things out in the natural world that only took her seven days. The only way to explain this is that magnetite was floated to the top as part of this magnetite fluid suspension. Something that Marie Edmonds at, uh, I think she's at Cambridge, which means I think Megan, you might have a tie to her, can't remember, but something she talked about sweeping up from a hypothetical perspective. And so, we put this model together, the bottom right, just to let you know, we've done melts modeling that verifies all of this. We've now started to add chlorine to understand the effect of chlorine. But all I want you to see in these images here on the top right is as a function of time where we decompress and quench right away, we let the experiment anneal for three hours and 72 hours, is the thickness of that magnetite layer gets bigger and bigger and bigger, thicker and thicker and thicker as a function of time. And we've done some scaling calculations where if you scale this up, this easily allows us to explain magnetite accumulations that we see in plutons around the world, as well as in iron oxide apatite deposits. We've done a lot of modeling to figure out what size magnet chambers you need, blah, blah, blah. Not time for that. It also, we wanted to understand the melt inclusions. So these are, run, these are photographs from our experiments. On the left-hand side is just an image on a transparent scope. The top of the experiment is here at the top where we've got this magnetite fluid suspension. On the right-hand side, I've got a BSE image and look at this magnetite crystal. What do you see? It's trapped melt inclusions. These would be the melt inclusions we observe in natural systems that bottom right, Yaika was able to blindly homogenize. So we put it all together and honestly, at the end of the day, everything seems simple. Over here on the left is this hypothetical cross section where it had been proposed or hypothesized that these systems are actually one system that transitions from iron oxide apatite mineralization at depth up into iron oxide copper gold mineralization at the surface. We're working a lot now on the right hand side to model how a hypothetical system would evolve as a function of time. But at the end of the day, we think we now have a model that is in essence a unifying model that explains all of the published observations for IOA and IOCG deposits in districts throughout South America, Australia, Missouri, Great Bear in Canada, elsewhere. The thing I'm chomping at the bit to get to next is where's the sulfur, but that'll be another talk. And we can link all of these to magmas. So the last couple of slides, and I promise, Mike Brown called me verbose once as an undergraduate and he was right. What are some of the results of our use of resources? And I just wanna make sure it's clear the message that we should be telling society, certainly the one that I tell society. Especially in the day and age of our pandemic, when we think about why do we mine, I know that the co-op in the student union, it closed after what was a long time. But we have some fond memories of going up there with the fills and getting just a smear of horseradish on a nice bread with some cheese and some lettuce and arugula. As a vegetarian, I didn't go for the meat. Sad that place closed because of financial mismanagement, but I'm sure Candela can talk about their economic lack of intellectual capacity. If we go back 130 years, bottom right, this is a guy named Ignaz Semmelweis, for those who don't know him. He was a doctor in Austria who figured out that when doctors would work on dead bodies and then turn around and cross the room and deliver babies, the reason the moms and the babies died is they were trans transmitting disease from the dead bodies to the living bodies and killing them. Figured out that if you use chlorine to wash your hands, holy moly, your hands are clean and the babies don't die. Sadly, nobody believed him. He was committed to an insane asylum and the guards beat him to death. But nobody today would not wash hands. And I'm sure Mary Candela would love to talk with you about the chlorine that uh, she, she's still with the American Chemical Society, I think. Anyway, 
here's, here's what mineral resources have done for us. And again, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm not going to say that mining companies have not created environmental degradation. I'm not going to say that colonization is a good thing. None of that is. I just want to highlight following up on Semmelweis and his concept, his ideation of hand washing and using chlorine as a sterilizer. Chlorine is something that has to be mined. We don't grow it. Look at maternal mortality over the last few hundred years since the Industrial Revolution plummeted around the world. Look at child mortality around the world the last few hundred years plummeted around the world. You know, if you read books from the 19th century throughout the United States, you think about European expansionism. Why did people have 10 kids? Because five of them died before the age of five. Why did men oftentimes have two or three wives? Because wife number one died while giving birth to child number four, and then wife two died while giving birth to child number three. And so what have we done with these resources? We've built medical infrastructure, hospitals, vaccines that have caused child mortality and maternal mortality to plummet. We look at childhood age by death, it has plummeted around the world, even for diseases as tragic as HIV and AIDS, we see a sort of plateau and a continual decline around the world. These are things that used to kill us. We used to shit ourselves to death. We don't do that anymore. Literally, we look at life expectancy. We see life expectancy is going through the roof around the world. Now, I know there are some wackos out there that think maybe we shouldn't live as long because we're using too many Earths. I take the opposite approach to that. I think that humans are an amazing species at the top of the animal kingdom, and we'll figure it out. We look at calorie consumption, we're fat. The US is the fattest country. I think Mexico is the second fattest country. And as more Chinese people eat McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, which we've put on them, the midsection and size of people in China is also growing. That's not good, but it also means that we're able to provide more food for people around the world. And what we see is undernourishment, precipitously declining everywhere that it has been measured. And this is significant. This means we're taking people in areas of the world who historically would die from hunger or be undernourished at a critical age in infancy and childhood, which affects brain development such that they cannot cognitively function at the highest levels possible. This is huge. This is something that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is actively working on. We have taken a world that if we go back a hundred years and we look at how many people lived in extreme poverty, it was all of us. It was every single one of us, except those who owned the manor home like Mike Brown's great grandparents in Downton Abbey. All of us lived in extreme poverty. We lived hand to mouth. We didn't have bank accounts. We literally grew what we eat. We killed what we ate. Or if we didn't have access to food or something to kill, we literally didn't eat. So when we look at the world population living in poverty, it is declining significantly no matter how uh, how you measure it. World population living in extreme poverty, we've gone from 1 billion to 7.5 billion, and we have significantly reduced the number of people around the world living in extreme poverty. And natural resources play a role. Poverty in the US has decreased significantly over the last 60 years. No matter what you read in the New York Times or the Washington Post, every now and then pick up the Wall Street Journal or Forbes and have a little bit of balance because resources play a role in decreasing this poverty. It has resulted in significant social spending. It allows us to retire at 65. We should be retiring at 100. We look at all of the vaccines that we create. And one of the things here I'll just let you know is all vaccines also have to nucleate on something. If you know anybody who's been treated for breast cancer, the medicine that they use is often one, the one of choice is cisplatin. The platin in cisplatin is platinum. They grow the molecules around the metal platinum and that metal platinum has to be mined. When we think of the Green New Deal, 100% primary energy to be replaced with renewables, that, that's a cash cow for mining companies. I've got graduate students that are fascinated and huge supporters of AOC and Markey when they introduce this. This requires mining. All 17 of the UN Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals, in some way, they require mining, but they require responsible mining. So we have to continue to mine to provide these resources whether it's wind turbines or hybrid cars or EVs or solar panels, we mine these resources from around the world. And here's why we have to do it. We live the bougie privileged life, we do. Anybody who's looking through the, the, the screen today thinking, oh my God, it's so hard. I went to pick up a loaf of sourdough, but they only had day old. 
if you travel around the world, and I've had the great fortune to travel, I've done research on seven continents, 64 countries the last time I actually counted them. If you travel around the world and see the billion people who have no access to what you have, and by no access, no access to running water, plumbing systems, electricity, they can't refrigerate medication for, for diabetes. Somebody who has type one or type two diabetes, you have to refrigerate insulin. So how do you actually treat diabetes in countries when there is no electrification, there is no way to keep insulin in a freezer or in a refrigerator? This is one area that I've become fascinated in over my career. On the left is one of my former graduate students, Daniel Corfe, who's now a professor. He's from and is now a professor at the University of Liberia here, lower left. Liberia right now, nationwide, 75 to 95% of its residents have no clean water. They have no ability to get rid of wastewater. They're drinking shallow contaminated waters from hand dug wells. They've had several civil wars, no electricity and not electricity just for air conditioning, no electricity for anything. And I learned more from Daniel the first time I took him into a grocery store when he literally got off the plane from Sub-Saharan Africa, the first time he had ever left Sub-Saharan Africa. And all he wanted was bread and mayonnaise. And he almost started to cry when he saw the abundance of choices of mayonnaise and bread. He had never been to a place where bread had preservatives and was put in a bag. He had never been to a place that had more than one type of mayonnaise. When we think about why we have to mine natural resources, and I admit we have to do a better job of reducing our footprint, the environmental impacts, we have to mine because I feel it's our moral imperative. It is our responsibility in the already developed countries to lift up the impoverished people around the world who are our global brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and nieces and nephews and cousins. And we have to allow them, they're all choosing this. Please don't somehow think that Daniel Corfe in Liberia says, oh, what do I need electricity for? They want it because they want the lifestyle, the life expectancy, the decrease in maternal mortality, the decrease in childhood mortality that we take for granted. So how do we do it? We can recycle our way there, that's a part of it, but we have to mine. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And then last three slides, promise you, if anybody's really interested in this, in terms of how resources connect with society, the betterment of society, the UN Sustainability Goals, I've worked over the last five years with lots of students to produce online teaching cases. We've done some, I go to West Africa every summer. I spend two to three weeks in Ghana and I help organize and teach a summer program for residents from across 10 countries in Ghana every August. We did it remotely this year. Hopefully next year we'll be there in person. We've worked on electronic waste. We've worked on rural electrification by developing microgrids. So we did field work in the Brazilian Pantanal, which is the middle of bum Brazil. How do you actually get electricity into areas that currently isn't connected to a coal-fired power plant? You don't need to build a coal-fired power plant. You can use solar and batteries and build a microgrid so you have refrigerators, you have medicine, you have education. One of the ones that I'm most proud of is I work with two students here, one of whom is originally from Ghana, and we spent a year and a half investigating how technology empowers female students and creates a more equitable and just environment for girls going through the K-12 system. And what do you need if you have technology? You need electricity. So last slide, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to questions if, if anybody's still watching. I just wanna give a shout out to make sure all the faculty on this call talk with your graduate students about mental health. I make it a priority. I start every meeting asking my graduate students how they are, not some bullshit, just how you doing, how's the day? How are you? Like, how are you doing? And I will tell you, it's not just the pandemic that makes us do this. This should be the way that we act all the time. Mental health challenges are not something that comes with a skin color. It's not a second language. As somebody personally who has gone through a number of mental health challenges in my own life and having family members who have suffered, you don't see it. People get really good at hiding mental health challenges. The last thing they want is to feel lesser than anybody else because they might be suffering from depression. We have to break that. We have to destigmatize that. And I just, I just give this call to all the faculty here, many of whom I took classes with and have deep admiration and respect for, and especially the younger faculty where I know sometimes there are these boundaries, what can I say, what can't I say? My honest opinion is those boundaries. 
when you recruit a graduate student, you're recruiting somebody with the goal of yes, producing primary data and publishing papers, but you should also be recruiting graduate students with the goal that you become in some way a surrogate parent and you help that person become the person they wanna be. I think when I look back on my time with the Phils, which, which was collectively six years between undergraduate and graduate school, I think I have so many fond memories of just shooting the shit, whether it's camping in Yosemite, whether it's Phil telling me to walk on the edge of a cliff over bushes to carry a rock that he wanted back from Idaho and the Sawtooth Mountains. Get to know your graduate students. They do suffer and they hide it. They're so anxious. They don't want you to think that they may be having problems. It is our responsibility to bring those problems to the forefront and communicate open and honestly about mental health issues to make sure that people who are suffering get the help that they need. And with that, I'm gonna shut up. Thanks very much, Adam. That was uh, insightful and uh, you brought up a lot of interesting uh, topics there. So if folks would like to ask questions, please use the raise hand function and I will uh, go ahead and turn your mic on. I will, we have a question from Mong Han and I will. Uh... Oh yeah, just real quick and cause I saw that John Merck put this in there. Yeah, one of my recent graduate students did her undergraduate honors thesis at Maryland and was in the honors college. She was originally from Northern New Jersey and it was the honors college that sucked her into Maryland. And she had a phenomenal time. Did her senior thesis with the Phils, then did a master's at UC Riverside, then did a PhD with me. And she then did a postdoc with Dominique Weiss at UBC. And she's now just started her third year as a tenure track assistant professor at Auburn University. Hey, Mong Hong, can you unmute that? There we go. Sure, yeah. Thank you, um, Adam. That was a very insightful talk and a lot of great information. I learned a lot. Um, I have a question that I'm trying to understand. So earlier you mentioned those um, IOCG deposits were along the fault system. So essentially along the coastline. I was wondering A, why, uh, why it is the case and B, why, uh, how about those along the volcanoes, which is like some kilometers east from that? I think that's my main question. Yeah, so, that, so to the first question, I probably did a piss poor job at, at explaining that all of these deposits, there, there's general agreement that they're all hypogene in nature, which means the fault was the permeable structure along which fluids ascended and the fluids, whether they were a melt or an aqueous fluid, the fluids were responsible for transporting the metals up that fault and then percolating into the hanging wall and foot wall um, to form the, the mineral systems that we observe today. So the faults are the structures. The faults are the same structures that bring magmas from the deep crust all the way up to the shallow crust and then ultimately the structures that allow that magma to erupt. Um, so they're extremely important. And, and in the mining community, that is a major part of mining geology. There are a lot of people with backgrounds in mining engineering and mining geology where their primary role is mapping the structure, both the, the, the visible structure, the outcrops at the surface, you know, classic strike and dip field camp type stuff. Um, and now over the last few decades, a lot of high resolution aeromag data so, so gravity inversions um, and, and other things that geophysicists use to try and image large to small volumes of the subsurface. And I'd be happy to send you some of those papers. I mean, there's some amazing stuff that the geophysics community is doing that, you know, it, it's like x-ray vision. It really has opened our eyes up to what we see below the surface without ever putting a drill into the subsurface. Right, but I guess my main question is why you don't see those along the volcanoes and you know, those are thrust sheets along the major mega thrust subduction zones. I would envision oh. moving toward hinterland, you will see something parallel, like another belt where you can get the same you, kind of de deposits. You, you do. And, and in okay. fact, in Chile, I only showed you the belt of, of IOCG and IOA deposits that are spatially associated with the Atacama Fault System. But you do see, um, you see in both directions, other belts that, that have uh, porphyry copper deposits that are associated with subduction related volcanic systems. So you do see it. I just only showed you the belts for the IOCG and IOA deposits. Okay, thank you. Mike Evans? Mike Evans? 
Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, um, thanks for this talk. Um, in the third half of your talk, you made the point that, um, that mining is responsible for a lot of the public health improvements over the past 50 to 100 years or, or longer. And, and I understand, um, if I got it correctly, that a lot of that is indirectly through basically electrification. But you also gave some examples of, of chlorine, uh, for instance, as a direct contributor. Could you give some other examples? For instance, I thought that most of this was because of the rise of antibiotics. Wait, Thanks. say the last part again. I didn't hear you. I thought that most of those, uh, those improvements in quality of life were, were related to um, antibiotics development. Oh, antibiotics. Absolutely. And, and I, I, if I said it, I'll correct myself. I'm not saying that, that mining is the cause for improving human life. It is part of that whole process. Sure. So, you know, there, there's the classic t-shirt, if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. If we think about the infrastructure today, you know, imagine what's happening right now as I'm talking in labs trying to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. That infrastructure, it can only be built by a combination of mining virgin resources and recycling resources that are already in the, the supply chain. And so, yeah, you're right. Those antibiotics, it's not the mining itself that develops the antibiotics, but it's the resources that build the infrastructure to house the humans that ideate and produce the antibiotics that have led to significant decline in, in all of those um, mortalities that I showed you. Sure, okay, thanks. And simultaneously, left a lot of shit in their wake when you look at historical mining operations. And so again, I think I mentioned, you, I can't sugarcoat that. And so a lot of the, in, in two of the classes I teach, I spend a lot of time talking about community relationships between mining companies and uh, you know, indigenous communities in Canada, in the United States, throughout South America, Australia. We continue to have a lot of problems because there are mining companies that have figured this out and there are still those that haven't really gotten the message that we have to pay attention to more than just how big a hole can we dig and how much metal can we get out of the ground. And the one I would highlight here for people to look into is the pebble deposit in South Central Alaska. It was in the news just yesterday because apparently Trump Jr. took his son on a fishing trip up there and tweeted out that they shouldn't allow that mine to go forward. One, because of its infringement on indigenous communities who hold that land sacred and two, because if there were ever a failure of a tailings dam there, it could be catastrophic for the salmon um, population as well as the entire aquatic ecosystem of Bristol Bay. Grad students, I encourage you to uh, ask questions. I'll push you to the front of the list. Sarah, I'm gonna unmute you or request that you unmute. Okay, hey, hey Adam, Sarah. how are you? It's good to yeah. hear, it's good, good to hear your talk. Um, my question is um, about the model. I thought that was a really intriguing idea with the bubbles and the magma, magnetite and everything. I was curious about the volume of fluid that would be required for that type of transport and the amount of chlorine, if there are like 35 weight percent chlorine in that fluid mm -hmm. and, and what that might tell us, if the model's correct, what, might, what that might tell us about the volume of magma that was required to, for these things to form and, and yeah, those kinds yeah. of. So, so we, 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 we modeled that for the Los Colorado system, 350 million tons of iron using magnetite solubility data um, for, for magnetite in a magmatic hydrothermal fluid over a range of pressures and temperatures. And you end up needing a volume of magma that's consistent with the volumes that igneous petrologists tell us exist below Mount St. Helens, below El Laco, below Vesuvius. The, the special part of the, the incorporation of the magnetite microlites into this sort of magnetite fluid suspension allows the, you, you end up decreasing the total volume of melt from which you need to source iron. Um, so for example, I think at Los Colorados, 350 million tons of iron, you would need a, a magma chamber that is something on the order of 70 to 90, you would need a total volume of magma, whether or not it's a chamber or not, a total volume of magma that would be something like 70 to 80 cubic kilometers of magma. If, if only a fluid is transporting iron, so there are no magnetite microlites involved. If you have a magnetite fluid suspension where 92% of that phase is fluid and 8% is magnetite microlites, 
you need a total magma volume of between 40 and 50 cubic kilometers. And then if you back out what the diameter of that caldera would look like, it's consistent with what, um, what we found in the volcanology literature for most arc volcanoes. And, and, and a follow-up question, if I can. So mm -hmm. do you think that these um, types of deposits form in subduction zones because of the structural control or because of the amount of chlorine or other sort of geochemical? Both and, both and all of the above. And that's really where, where I'd like to go next. I mean, I actually, a couple of your students were on earlier today and, um, and I just wrote a postdoc, NSF postdoc letter for Jesse Walters, who you probably know from Maine. You know, I, it, it, we don't know, Sarah, we don't. You know, what, what there, there's, there's a lot less sulfur than porphyry deposits. There's a lot less sulfur than, than mafic layered intrusions like you've worked on in the Bushveld. If you look at, for example, porphyry and IOA IOCG deposits, the iron grades and contents are the same. Copper is this, everything about them is the same except sulfur. You know, in a classic porphyry deposit like, like Bingham Canyon, there's a billion tons of sulfur. In these world-class IOCG deposits, which are copper deposits, there's 20 million tons of sulfur. So where's the sulfur? We think that all the isotopes we've been working on, fingerprint, a silicate magma is the source. Everywhere that we've looked and, and looked in the literature, they're all related to subduction zones. There have been some hypotheses out there. A friend of mine, Jeremy Richards, who tragically passed away a couple of years ago, he had hypothesized that it could be a change in the angle of subduction, or it could be related to compression versus extension, so trans-tension. One of the things we observe in the Chilean iron belt is that a lot of the IOCG and IOA deposits, in the IOCGs, they mineralize very shallow that you can you can have mineralized uh, pillow basalts and so you know these are systems where that hypogene fluid is getting close enough to the surface that it's mineralizing relatively young pillow basalts so that that's something that we're just now starting to try and understand i have a student who's working on that to try and figure out what is it about the tectonic framework if the silicate melts are chlorine rich why Right. I mean, most porphyry systems evolve from silicate melts that might have five to 12 weight percent NaCl equivalent chlorine. How can these systems be more chlorine rich? What's being subducted? And then getting into your area of expertise in that subduction zone factory, when we know fluids are baking off during prograde metamorphism, how are those fluids evolving that might be transporting a lot of chlorine into the mantle wedge? Right. What, what's special about, you know, I don't know, dewatering of various you know, micas and fengite and, and other stuff in your world. Um, and, and how does that happen so that in these particular belts, these districts, you can get a lot of chlorine from the, subducted, from the subducting slab and overlying sediments into the mantle wedge. And right now we just don't know, but it's, it's a really fruitful area for research. Cool, thank you. Karin, then Grace, then Will. You. Um, when you were showing the diagrams at the end, which made me laugh because I sort of end my uh, geomorph class sort of showing some of the trends that have been occurring in the world around, you, like you, like uh, Mike Evans said, you ascribed a lot of this to the natural resources that we need, but to include among those natural resources is actually the intellectual capacity of very many people. Oh yeah. And I'm bringing that up because along with all of those trends, which have a major point in that, uh, infant mortality change and wasn't the fact that we could wash our hands with chlorine because frankly soap does a pretty damn jo good job of yep. getting bacteria off your skin yep. it, it's a good surfactant you, you, uh, clearly chlorine helps a little bit but just washing your hands with soap and water uh, does a lot it was having women to have more control over their own lives the yep. number of, of children dropped from an average of six in 1900 in the U.S. to two as it is present. And that uh, follows that infant mortality uh, decline. And we see that around the world, but there are also the positive things which are also human decision-making. And so one of the human decision-making things that was a very positive thing were two of them actually. One is the decline in acid rain and one is the saving of the ozone hole, yep. which was a global compact was created for God's sakes with uh, Thatcher and Reagan in office and it was Thatcher, who, who of course was a chemist originally, mm -hmm. who said, we should do this. We can do this. And the world got together and said, okay, we're gonna you know, stop putting CFCs into the atmosphere. 
something that we clearly should be considering with CO2 and uh, global warming, uh, which is pretty devastating at this point. So, you know, when we're talking about resources, sometimes intellectual resources can uh, really offset some of the need for some of, of the, the natural resources, recycling being essentially among yep. those, but there's a lot of other options as well. I, I agree with you 100% and, and include that in my classes as well. You know, you talk about closing the loop, which Apple yep. has talked about in their robot Daisy, where they want to recycle every metal that's in an iPhone. You know, right now we landfill 99% of the rare earth metals that are in technology. The case, that I, the, the case study that I just worked on with two students in Ghana your, your point is, is it's, it's perfect. You know, it's about empowering girls to grow up as, as, as being part yeah. of the intellectual community. And that change, in the, edu edu yeah, the change in education of women is, is what allows them to, uh, you know, basically lower the number of kids that they have, which mm -hmm. leads to a, a lot of other things. It's, it's, it's right. super important globally. And, anyway, and that leads anyway, ultimately um, to, a, to a total in terms decline. of the of appetite hosted, uh, or appetite associated deposits. Uh, what uh, rare earth and other metals are you finding in the appetite? Does that vary significantly um, among the sites? Or so do people it, not know that yet? It, right now, most of the appetite that we've worked with seems to be enriched in the light rare earths. There are some deposits where the, the research that's being published indicates that they can be enriched in the heavies. There's yeah. a lot of effort right now. In fact, there, there was a part of the, the USGS Mineral Resources Program. One of their researchers just did a study where they went through the Adirondack Mountains and they looked at appetite in mine tailings from historic iron and copper mines. And, and it was to just come up with a resource estimate for the total rare earth elements that may <laughs> be there. They're now doing that for Missouri where there was a lot of historic iron mining. And, and that's gotten a lot Some of support. Big from appetite the deposits in uh, yep. Southern Canada as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and what's nice about this is because, well, among many reasons, because our military is so dependent, it is something Republicans are willing to support. So even the Trump administration has increased the budget for the people of the U.S. doing that specific research. Focus more on domestic supply, which I'm a big fan of because I think that we possess the intellectual know-how and the technology to mine at what should be a minimal environmental footprint. I think there's just too much of an historic track record of companies going into the developing world. And no matter what promises are made upfront about how invested they are in protecting the local environment and the local communities, there are just too many horror stories where that goes wrong. And, and it's a combination of graft, and, and the perverse power structure that exists in those countries when you're talking about resource rent that's being paid to the leaders of the country who have military control. All right, go ahead, Grace. Okay, I'm Grace. I'm a second year PhD student. I have three questions. Mm -hmm. First one is, do you think we have enough resource on the earth? Do you think we need to seek for space mining? The second question is, do you think it's morally okay for us to mine our moon? The third question is, <laughs> what would be the responsible way for us to mine on the moon? So for number two, I, yeah, it wouldn't cause me to lose sleep over, over a moral question. I mean, I'm sure philosophers can, just, can debate about that, but you know, if we could oh, develop exactly. the ability to mine the moon, sure, why not? Um, I, I think that's a long way out into the future before that would become economic, right? It's what, 250,000 miles, so it's a half million miles round trip. All of the metals that we might think about mining on the moon, we find them in the ocean, right? So we talk about, you know, sea salt that we can, we can mine simply by evaporating seawater, but, you know, we, we ultimately could mine copper and uranium from the ocean if push came to shove and somebody figures out a way, back to Karin's comment about intellectual, um, um, you know, the, the role for intellectual development. Um, do we have enough? The answer is yes. We certainly have enough to, 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 to get the Green New Deal done. We have enough to transition away from fossil fuels. What we know we don't have enough of is fossil fuels to last infinitely into the future. You know, no matter how you look at it, coal reserves are gonna die out in maybe 500 to 800 years if we continue using them at the, the current rate or the rate at which they were used historically. Natural gas and all of the implications for climate change we know natural gas is a finite resource and anything is finite if nature makes it at a rate slower than we, we mine and consume it. I am, I am really hopeful that um, 
as, as, we, as we move forward in the next few decades, we're gonna see renewable energy resources really take over the world, A, because they're cheaper, so they make fiscal sense, right? Any economist will tell you that if you have the option of building a coal-fired power plant or a wind turbine and battery storage, and the wind turbine and battery storage is half the price, you go with the, the, the option that's half the price. And when you look at the modeling for copper and rare earths and other components that you need for renewable energy, we absolutely have that. I'm also hopeful that we see a trend continuing with Gen Z and their kids that more people wanna live in urban areas where we know we have an overall lesser environmental footprint per square meter and the resource consumption is less. So we get smarter there. As we empower girls and women in the developing world, we see birth rates decline. And, and all of that, you know, that ties with democracy and so many other social metrics. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I think the answer to number one is yes. The answer to number two is I'm not morally bothered. The answer to number three, I think is it right now is not economical to think about mining the moon, but maybe someday. Will Hoover for the last question. Thanks for holding on. Yeah, um, well, I had a question about like, the mechanics of transporting these microlites once you get kind of out of the, the igneous realm. Once yep. you start transporting fluids in fractures and eventually depositing them somewhere where you have 90% magnetite, like what does that look like in terms of you know, relating it to kind of a standard idea of how a vein forms. Like how does, how does all yeah. of that work yeah. together? So, so if somebody on this, on this um, Zoom call has this answer, I'd, I'd love for you to email me and we could talk about it. One of the things that's most intriguing about these IOA, IOCG deposits is there's no evidence for an explosive brecciation event. So if you look, for example, at porphyry deposits, which form in subduction related volcanic, volcanic um, environments after volcanic activity has ceased. Those are explosive events. And those have been modeled going back decades where you have a magma chamber and you have bubbles within the magma chamber where the force per unit area of those bubbles can often exceed twice the lithostatic pressure load on that magma chamber. And as those bubbles accumulate, they literally shatter the roof of the magma chamber or the solidification front and you see that in, in quartz veining, stockwork quartz veining, which is ubiquitous in porphyry systems. In the, in the IOCG IOA world, you don't see that. You don't have stockwork veins. And, and to date, nobody has found evidence for an explosive event. So it seems that somewhere between explosive and passive, these, these fluid magnetite suspensions are able to, to physically evolve from their source magma chamber a long pre-existing faults where it's easy to envision that the fault itself is also the conduit for the magma that's moving up from the lower and middle crust. Um, you know, often these are, you can, you can image these, you know, geophysically, and these are deep basement penetrating faults when we're talking about the Atacama and other places. You find these along suture zones like you have in, in the Missouri area. Karuna people now, I think while there's still debate, it was a subduction zone complex at the time the Karuna mineralization was forming. And so that, we don't have that answer. Um, I, I would love to work, I, I would love to get somebody involved who does that type of geophysical modeling. You know, how do you actually model magma chamber here, mineralization up there? What is that right from the laws of physics, permeability relationships that allows these fluid suspensions to actually ascend? And then once they ascend, you know, magnetite is growing, it's gonna gravitationally, it's gonna reach some level of, you know, neutral gravity where it can't ascend any further. And so that's what we think we observe or we have observed so far in most of the deposits is magnetite is, is focused at the bottom. And do you get some sort of, like I think about in magma chambers, you think about the rheological lockup where at some point yep. you have enough crystal. Do you have any yep. idea like where you would expect that along the path where you have magnetite that's big enough that it starts to just block up the pathway? Does it ever get to that point? I don't know yet. You know, the melts modeling that we've done has been just to understand the liquid line of descent for an andesite or a slightly mafic andesite. And, and, you know, the input parameters allow us that, you know, magnetize the liquidus phase. And, and I probably didn't show it for long enough, but if you look at the melts model results, magnetite at pressures of one to two kilobars Magnetite is the liquidus phase, then the melt reaches water saturation. If the initial concentration of water in the melt is close to water saturation, 
such that crystallization of magnetite and slight decompression drives it to water saturation. And then CPX and PLAJ, they don't come in for another 150 degrees. So there's a lot of time where magnetite is crystallizing in the, in the presence of, of, of an exolving magmatic hydrothermal fluid. And it's easy to imagine in that type of case, like our experiments, if there is no crystal mush, then it just floats to the surface. What happens when you start developing, as you call the rheological lockup, you know, you've got you know, 40, 50, 60 weight percent crystals and the remaining is liquid. You would then need, you'd need some sort of structural tears that would be the perme permeability channels that would allow that to ascend. And, and that's what we, that, that's among the things that we wanna work on next that's beyond the expertise I have in my group and really would require somebody who, who comes at it from a geophysical perspective or a, you know, somebody who models petroleum basins. Cool, thanks. All right, well, thanks very much, Adam, for a very stimulating talk. And thanks for everybody for hanging around and uh, speaking to Adam. Have Thank you weekend. all. All right, have a great Friday evening.